Hi there, and welcome to this mini lesson of the Science of Farmstead Cheese online course brought to you by the Vermont Cheese Council. This Blue Cheese 101 mini lesson is meant to give you an idea of what we'll be covering in the rest of this course if you choose to sign up. This will specifically cover a little bit about the milk composition that goes into blue cheese, how its pH changes over time due to mold metabolism, and also covering some of the flavor chemistry, also part of that mold metabolism, and finally, ending with a little bit of crystal chemistry, since that is very interesting and, of course, my favorite thing to talk about in the fun world of cheese. If you're reviewing this mini lesson as part of the free pe preview option when you went to register for the course, feel free to continue on. If you want to listen to the rest of the course, it, uh, it'll prompt you. If you're listening to this video elsewhere on the Internet, you can go to this link here, cheesescience.org slash course, to register for this course. You will have to understand that many of the things I'll be mentioning here, I will make reference to other modules in this course because this is meant to give you an idea of what we'll be covering. A lot of the nitty gritty science and chemistry we'll be covering in a lot more detail in other modules. So bear with me. Okay, let's get started and talk about milk. You can't make cheese without milk. The milk we use for blue cheese, you often add cream to. And the reason you want to add cream is to increase the fat content. As we cover in later modules, fat equals flavor for many reasons. Some of the biochemistry reactions take place in fat, but fat also serves as the pool of sorts to where flavor molecules can store themselves. The fat and the milk and the cream used for your blue cheese is often homogenized, especially at industrial levels. Uh, that is because it takes fat globules, which look like this in unhomogenized milk, and turns them into this. They're much smaller and much greater surface area. And as we'll learn later, that greater surface area has a lot more chance for flavor creation because of lipase activity and lipolysis reactions. I'd be remiss if I didn't cover really briefly that the United States FDA actually does classify two separate blue cheeses. They have standards of identity, which we cover in module one. Here you can see what the standard of identity for blue and gorgonzola are. As you can see, the moisture content differences in the, is basically the only major difference that blue cheese can have a higher moisture than gorgonzola. Not necessarily true when you go over to the European side of things, but this is how the United States government chooses to define blue and gorgonzola. And there are a few other things as well. If you go into module one, we actually talk about in depth the blue cheese standard of identity because it is a really interesting one to read. So you can't make blue cheese without blue mold. The two main species of blue mold used for blue cheese is Penicillium glaucum and Penicillium roque 40. Uh, you may see roque 40 here. You may say, hey, that sounds a lot like roque for cheese. It very well is. The, the microbe was named after the cheese, not the other way around, which is, I think, a pretty cool demonstration of how the scientific world takes a lot from the food world, and specifically dairy and cheese, since these are some of the longest researched items on the planet. Over here, this image here, I took from a scientific journal article. You can read down here. And this just shows an example of all the different penicillium molds that might be available to cheesemakers. These are all commercial molds and also some that they just took from the environment, which can end up in cheese. The point I want to get across is there's lots of variation, lots of diversity in molds out there. You may see me mention these two. Chances are, if you're using blue mold spores to make your cheese right now, it's not just these two. It's much more complex than that. There are subspecies, sub-subspecies, bio-variants of these that are being used that you purchase from culture houses. So the idea when you talk about penicillin roque 40 being the blue mold you use for roque for cheese, in actuality, it's much more complicated from that because not only are you using actual mold spores that you purchase from a culture house, but you can also pick up mold from the environment, uh, the natural flora, so to speak. I'll put flora in quotes here. The mold spores in the aging caves, for example. The mold spores in the milk that you got from the farm. The mold spores are in your production facility as well. And part of making blue cheese is to allow those molds to really go into overdrive and to actually take over and produce those interesting flavors and textures that we all associate with blue cheese. So let's dive in right now to cheese pH and how it changes while blue cheese is being made and aged. Uh, we start at the top here at 6.7. Remember, that's about the pH of milk. And the reason it's slightly acidic, we cover in later modules, specifically module two, the, the, the dairy chemistry module. But let's look at blue cheese, say, the day you make it and the day you're actually going to go sell it. You have to let it age, let the mold grow. 
So here's some examples. We have blue cheese later in life up here. We have blue cheese early in life down here. So blue cheese at day one very possibly has a pH of around 4.6. And remember, low pHs mean acidic. And the reason this is acidic is if you remember, starter cultures, which you cover in, in module three in depth, they break down lactose into lactic acid. And that, remember, will cause the pH to drop. But what happens now, you've made your cheese, the starter cultures have done their job, they fermented the lactose into lactic acid, that's why it's so acidic with a low pH. But now you're going to do things to that cheese to encourage mold to grow. And a few weeks later, it's very possible that that pH of the cheese could re reach easily pH of 6.5, almost where we started with the original milk. So what gives? What causes great change in pH? Well, that acid went away. Mold spores ate the lactic acid. Remember, we have lactic acid in our cheese that our starter cultures made. Well, the idea is that the molds come along and they actually consume that lactic acid. They consume that lactic acid. That means less acid. The pH will go up. Not only that, molds also produce things like ammonia which are a natural byproduct in many cheese aging reactions. Ammonia are basic compounds. These also can raise the pH. So between the consumption of lactic acid and the production of ammonia due to protein breakdown, which we we'll cover in just a bit, you can get the pH to go right back up almost to the starting milk. That's not unheard of. And that's why we often see, especially blue cheeses, the ones that are not aged out properly can often be way too acidic and you may think, well, uh, blue cheese tastes acidic to me. Well, that's probably due to other flavor compounds in there that are sort of giving you that piquant sort of bitiness that people associate with acidity. But if you ever had a blue cheese that isn't properly aged, you will notice acidity because not only will the texture be different, uh, the flavor will be very different as well. So let's look at that in another way. I took these examples from a textbook about cheese chemistry and cheese microbiology. Over here, you can see an example of a wheel of cheese they took out and they, they measured certain things of it over a certain time. This is a wheel of blue cheese. And they took a little cross section here. That's what these zero ones and means. These are just coordinate systems. They took that cross section. And then if you, if you look down here to these two panes, you can sort of see there's some dashed lines there with numbers. And those are pH values. Remember, pH is a measure of acidity, inversely related. We cover that in depth throughout this entire course many, many times. So if you don't get it now, you'll definitely get it there that they're an inverse relationship. The point is, if we look at week one, we see some very interesting pH values. You see 4.4 4 to 4.6. Again, that is all has to do with the starter culture. This is a very acidic environment. A few weeks later, four weeks later, we go over to week five. Now let's look at that pH. On the outside, we have a pH of around 5. On the inside, we have a pH of around 6.4. So remember, these higher values mean a lot less acid was created, or I should say the acid was consumed, like we just talked about, that the molds ate the acid. And it sort of makes sense that the inside of the cheese has a much higher pH, because what's on the inside of the cheese more than the outside? The mold spores. The molds grow best on the inside of the cheese, because on the outside, with uh, there can be many reasons for that. The outside's extra salty because it's in the brine, so that slows down mold growth. That's just one example. So this was just repeating myself in the previous slide. You can see on week one, you have really low pHs, really acidic cheese, but a few weeks later, that pH goes right back up because of those mold spores, and you notice a, a, quite a difference between a cross-section of cheese as well. But that will equilibrate over time if the cheese is given enough time to age. And if you're going to crumble up that cheese, well, you're going to equilibrate it yourself anyway because you're going to crumble it up and mix it up anyway. So now let's talk about oxygen. Oxygen is often abbreviated O2 in the chemistry world. Oxygen is really important because molds need to breathe. Molds need to breathe. That is important enough that I will write it down. Molds need to breathe. I might have misspelled breathe there. Well, I'm a scientist, not an English person. So there we go. Under normal conditions, this is what you'd expect blue mold to look like. It has that nice bright color that's either greenish blue, bluish green, gray blue, those kinds of color. If you vacuum pack blue cheese, you often get that yellow look. Not only does this visually look unappealing, this also can be associated with off flavors. 
Molds are living things. They have living metabolisms. And when you stress them, just like you'd stress us, they create byproducts that they're not used to. In this case, oxygen-starved mold can produce off flavors, weird colors, and cause really bad blue cheese. So that's why it's really important to never vacuum pack blue cheese. Let's get a little bit into flavor chemistry. We cover this reaction in much more depth later on in the course, especially in the later modules when we talk about cheese aging chemistry. You have fatty acids. If you remember, fatty acids are coming from triglyceride molecules, which sort of look like this. Again, you'll see animations later on. Those get clipped off. They form free fatty acids. Now, the mold spores here will take those free fatty acids and start to even work them more. They'll eat them, break them down to other compounds. Uh, a lot of those compounds are what are called methyl ketones. A methyl ketones is a type of chemical compound. Don't need to be concerned with the name. But one particular type of one called 2-heptanone is really distinctive with blue cheese. If you smell it on its own, it really does have that sort of blue aroma, we like to say. So this is one of those key critical flavor chemistry reactions that is really unique to blue mold. And finally, let's talk about proteolysis. We talked about flavor chemistry, and let's talk a little bit about the texture chemistry. Blue cheese on day one, if you go to melt it, it won't melt very well. As you can see here, it's, it's a low melting cheese. Anyone who's actually eaten blue cheese when it's ready to be eaten, though, knows that it melts beautifully. You put it on burgers, it really melts well. It, it looks like this. And that's all has to do with the maturation and aging time. This is a high melting cheese. As you can see, it fell apart. You get, you get free fat here. There's really no structure to speak of whatsoever. It melts really well. What's going on there is the mold breaks down the protein. That is called proteolysis. Proteolysis means protein breakdown. And we cover that in much more depth later on in the course. The mold physically itself will clip those proteins. And now that there's no structure there, the fat can't hold on to itself, it can't hold on to each other, you apply any bit of heat, the structure falls apart. We talk about cheese melting chemistry a lot more in depth later on in the course as well. So stay tuned if you want to learn more about that because it's much more complicated than just proteolysis. And finally, the last little bit of blue cheese science we want to talk about are crystals. You can find three main crystal types in blue cheeses. As you can see here, this is some blue cheese I mashed up and put through a funnel. And all those little white specks, those are various types of crystals. Here's another image here. You can see little crystal specks surrounding the veins. And the main types of crystals you'll find in cheese are going to be calcium phosphate, tyrosine, and leucine. And that's these chemical structures down here. You don't need to be too concerned about which one's which. But what you do need to know is that calcium phosphate, that is a mineral-based crystal, which is unique in its chemistry it forms. And tyrosine and leucine are amino acid-based crystals, AA is an abbreviation for amino acid. Now you're wondering, why are these coming about? All has to do with the blue mold metabolism and how it changes the pH during cheese making. As you'll learn in later modules, the mineral balance, calcium and phosphate being important ones in cheese, is vastly dependent on pH. The fact that the mold is doing wacky things to that can cause mineral type crystals. And then proteolysis, as you'll learn later, amino acids make up proteins. You break down the proteins as constituent parts like amino acids. They form high enough amounts they can crystallize out and you get amino acids in blue cheese as well. So really interesting cross-section of two types of mineral, uh, two types of crystals rather that you see in blue cheese. Um, pretty cool chemistry. So thank you for your attention, listening to this mini lesson on blue cheese. I hope it was interesting to you and I hope that it engages you and, and you may consider joining the rest of the course now to learn more cheese chemistry and cheese science much more in depth. Learning the foundational knowledge of cheese in a technical way is really valuable, not only if you're making cheese, but if you're trying to sell cheese, or if you want to be a more engaged consumer of cheese in general. Thank you for your time, and I hope you come back and learn more.